Hello, KW community. Thank you for joining us again at Kitchen Warehouse um, in our in-store kitchen. Today, we are going to be doing sourdough pizza with Ange from Sourdough Bread Smith. The pizza oven just dinged, it's getting hot. And um, my friends know this is one of my favorite appliances and I love pizza for entertaining. So let's welcome Ange to show us how to make sourdough pizza. Come on, Ange. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me today and thanks for tuning in. So I've had a couple of requests to do sourdough pizza. And well, when Joe from Kitchen Warehouse asked, I couldn't really say no. So we've been working on a nice, easy, neapolitan styley pizza um, to run you through today. So this is kind of loosely based on um, a pizza as you would find in Naples, and it's a bit of a nod to my Italian heritage, but we're giving it the breadsmith twist. So to try and get something that's really authentic and really achievable at home, we're going to work with a slightly low hydration dough. We're going to be working with some lovely high protein flours and a lovely local coarsely uh, ground whole grain semolina from my local miller and um, some other wonderful ingredients, which we'll get to as we step through the recipe. Now, sourdough pizza. Well, it all starts with the sourdough, doesn't it? So this is our little sourdough starter. And if you don't have one of these yet, what have you been doing with lockdown? I mean, did you really even ISO if you didn't sourdough? But fear not, we've got a recipe and a really easy method for that online. Get onto a, the website, breadsmith.com, and uh, get the instructions for how to do that on there. But basically, what you want is a really nice, active sourdough starter to kick off your recipe. Now, before you use it, you're going to want to make sure that it's been fed a couple of times, and it's nice and active, and it's doubled in size. So this is Jill. You can see that that's where I started off uh, when I fed her. And uh, she's now doubled in size and is ready to go. Now you can see I've actually done quite a small amount of starter. Um, I've taken to maintaining a much smaller amount of sourdough recently uh, to reduce the amount of flour that I'm using and also to reduce the amount of discard that we have to deal with. Although there are lots of lovely recipes for how to deal with that, so don't throw it away. Um, my great-gran, who we all knew as Ma, the Italian uh, heritage I was talking about, she would be mortified if you threw any of that away. So her motto was waste, not want not, and that's something I've sort of carried through. All right, so once we've got our nice active sourdough starter, we've got a rye one, what we're going to do is build up a nice fresh batch of sourdough starter because we're obviously going to need a little bit more than this but as well as that I keep a 100% rye starter and um, that's not necessarily the flavor profile we're going to want to go with in our Neapolitanish pizza. So we're going to build 11 which is basically the terms interchangeable with starter but for our purposes it's just our fresh purpose-made of our little teeny tiny starter here and getting that into a slightly larger jar because we are going to need 100 grams of leaven for our recipe. So we'll get that out. It's going to be about half of what I've got in my little jar here, I reckon. And that will be enough to get our leaven going. So 14 grams. Get yourself a nice digital scale. It really does make all the difference. And um, we are almost there, just a teeny bit more. Come on. Hey, there we go. All right, cool. Put that back to one side. Now, we're gonna go in with another 20 grams of water. So it's really easy to start building up the leaven. We're basically going to triple up the amount of starter that we've got in there at the first step. So, in with our 20 grams of water. Now that's just room temperature tap water. Um, it's always nice if you can let it stand for a little bit just to let any chlorine evaporate because that's you know, not very nice for our little sourdough starter here. And then what I do is just break up the starter a little bit so it makes sort of a milky liquid. That's just gonna distribute our little yeasty beasties nice and evenly. So our sourdough starter is just, well, it's, uh, it's a colony basically. It's, it's a, a community of little 
uh, yeasty beasties, natural yeast that lives on the grains. So it's really important that you're buying nice organic uh, grains. So that's going to set you up for success. And really friendly, good bacteria. So that's what makes sourdough so healthy for us compared to using a um, commercial baker's yeast or the likes. Plus, you can make this at home. So once we've mixed that through, we're just going to go in with 20 grams of plain white baker's flour. Now get that in there, make it up to 60 grams. Easy, easy, easy. Teeny bit more. There we go. Give that a little mix, combine that nicely. Um, um, just a anyone who's viewing at the moment, if they can't keep up with it, we've, um, the recipe will be on the blog and also you can catch it again later on YouTube as well, on our YouTube channel. Thanks, Joe. And um, yeah, you can download that recipe from my website as well. I've added a comment in the comments field with a little code so you can get that off the website and that way you subscribe to any um, changes so you get a digital update and you'll also subscribe to my mailing list. So. Please do that if, you, if you'd like to stay up to date with what's happening. All right, so we've now built our little leaven here. Uh, that's the first step of it. Basically, you're gonna wanna start this at least the day before you wanna build your sourdough pizza. Now, um, we're gonna leave that sitting at room temperature, loosely covered, fruit flies love it. So make sure you've got you know, a well-fitting lid there and it's you know, properly closed up, no gaps, but you don't want it airtight because you know, it's going to produce a little bit of gas as it matures and we need that to be able to escape. So set that to one side, give it sort of four to 12 hours. You can sort of play with the timings here. If you want it to happen a little bit quicker, put it somewhere warmer. Um, and in that time, what you'll notice is that the leaven uh, increases in size. And once it's sort of doubled up, then we're going to go in with our second refresh. So we're going to build that up a little bit more, make sure it's super active. So to our uh, 60 grams of leaven, we're going to double it up with 30 grams of water, 30 grams of flour. Mix that in, put it to one side. Four to 12 hours later, you are going to have a lovely active leaven. And you can see, you know, we've still got a little bit of the rye signature through there, but quite a color difference between the two and um, that's going to come through in the flavor. Now if you already have a very active white sourdough starter knocking around on your bench top then feel free to use that and bypass the whole leaven building step. Um, so you can see this is now more than doubled in size. I put some little tape on there to show where I was at 10 a.m. this morning when I did the last refresh and we've got a good increase in size there. Lots of lovely bubbles, heaps of activity. If you have a look in there, we've got a lovely active leaven that's ready for us to bake with. So now that we've got that together, we will move on to building our sourdough pizza dough. Sourdough pizza dough. Yep. So for that, we're going to use a stand mixer. It's just a bit easier, but you can do this by hand. And we're going to loosely be following um, the sourdough beginner's method. Uh, so if, you, if you've been through that before with me, then we're going to be in very familiar territory. Uh, if not, have a look at that for that online as well. It's on the Kitchen Warehouse blog, on their YouTube channel and on my stuff. So you can do this by hand, uh, but to make things a little bit easier for ourselves and with the time frame today, we're going to be using a stand mixer here. So we'll get our bowl get that over to our scales because we're doing everything in grams and it's much easier on a digital scale. And we're going to go in with our water. So we want to put about 250 grams of room temperature or tepid water into our bowl. And uh, this is where we can, again, make the timings work for us. We can make things happen a little bit more quickly if we're using a slightly warmer water to begin with, and then by putting it somewhere slightly warmer as well to do its proof. So, let's get our 250 grams of water in here. And that is going to be 
about 60%, 56-60% ish of our total recipe. Now, recipes are generally expressed in uh, baker's percentages, which makes it really easy to scale them up and down. Now, the percentage is all uh, expressed in relation to the total amount of flour. So if we've got a kilo of flour, and we want a 50% uh, hydration, then we're gonna go in with 500 grams of, flour, of water. With me? Excellent. All right, so we've got our water in there. The next thing we're gonna go in with is our lovely active leaven. So let's just chuck that in there. Now, we've made up just enough for our recipe as well, so I know I'm gonna put pretty much all of that into my bowl, and that's gonna be my roughly 20%-ish of sourdough starter or leaven so get that in there and what we notice with this is that the starter is actually floating on top of the water which is good for two reasons one it tells us that our starter our leaven is full of air super active good to go and secondly it just means it's going to mix nicely through the water in the bowl and not get stuck along the bottom, which is often a problem when you're using a stand mixer. So if you're doing this by hand, you can put your flour and dry ingredients in first. If you're doing this in a stand mixer, you're going to want to put your water in first. Otherwise, you're going to find that there's a layer of dry flour around the bowl. It's just going to be a bit of a ha hassle to, um, to, uh, to sort out. So I like to just get in there and uh, loosely mix that in just show you there how um, it's actually floating on top of the water. If you can see that. And we're just gonna mix that in. Just break it up a little bit, just to make sure that it's nicely distributed through the water. We're just gonna make sure everything's even even when we start mixing. So get that in there. Right, that's done. Now, let's talk about our flour. We're going to be using a Fancy Pants Italian Tipo Double Zero flour over here. Um, the stuff to look for when you're shopping for your pizza flour is that it's a nice fine flour. And as well as that, you're going to want to check that it's a high protein. So this, I think, is about 14, maybe 15 grams of protein. That's going to give us a really nice strong dough. So. That's the majority of our flour component. We're gonna go in with two thirds of our double zero nice fine flour. But then to introduce some of those lovely, you know, local grains that our sourdough starter has been born, born and raised on, we're gonna be adding a third of our flour component of this lovely sort of whole grain. You can see how sort of creamy that is. There's still a very good whole grain component of that, of this lovely semolina flour. And that's gonna make the dough really manageable. It's also going to give the, 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 the pizza more flavor and give you a nice sort of crusty pizza crust, which is definitely something we wanna go for. So let's go in with our semolina first, because that's gonna take a little bit longer to soak up the water. So I just like to put it in first. And we're going in with 150 grams of semolina. Now, this is where it's kind of Neapolitan-ish because with the proper Neapolitan pizza, you'd probably just use Tipo double zero and not put the semolina in. Um, I find it makes the recipe a lot more manageable. It's easier to deal with. And as I mentioned, it gives it that lovely flavor. So we get that in there. Um, if you don't have semolina at home and you want to have a crack at the recipe, maybe just halve the amount and uh, put in um, some whole wheat flour instead. That'll still give you a lot of the enzymes and stuff that are going to be in our nice coarse semolina flour here that will kickstart the uh, fermentation and activity in our sourdough dough. <laughs> Right, so let's move on with that. We'll just give that a little mix in. 150 grams of semolina, which is our, a third of our dry flour component. And then we're gonna go in with the rest of our flour, which is gonna be 350 grams 
of tipo 0, 0. Let's get that in. And that brings up our dry component to 450 grams. There we go. Right, now, the next thing we're going to go in with, which is where we deviate slightly from our traditional Neapolitan pizza as well, is with a bit of olive oil. Now, uh, that again is for a couple of reasons. It makes it taste good. It's nice and easy to uh, handle the dough when it's got a little bit of oil in it. As well as that, it's going to help you get a really nice crispy base in uh, your home oven or your uh, little uh, electric pizza oven because we do get really nice high temperatures with that but it's probably still not quite the you know scorching million degrees that you get in a traditional pizzeria wood-fired oven so we'll go in with our olive oil and it's going to benefit it now get yourself some nice olive oil we've gone local here came in a fancy bottle which is always nice and if you'll pardon the pun it's always worth splashing out for the good stuff here and we're going to go in with 20 grams of that, which is about 4% of our recipe if you're following the baker's percentages. Once you've got all that in there, we're going to get it onto the stand mixer and give it a little rough mix. And that's just basically to combine wet and dry ingredients. We're not looking to develop any gluten at this stage. And um, we'll do that all in the next bit once it's had a little bit of a rest. So let's get this onto our stand mixer. Whoops, there we go. It's a bit different. Uh, everything's backwards from here. <laughs> well, it could just be me. No. We like to challenge the demonstrators here with doing everything and with their eyes shut, basically <laughs> facing the camera. All right, so we're going to put our KitchenAid on low and slow with a dough hook and just combine those ingredients. And as I said, all we're going for here is just to combine the wet and dry ingredients. And that is going to give it a chance to have its auto -lees which is another baking term for you. Uh, that basically just means let it have a little soak. The flour is going to absorb all of that water. It's going to kickstart the gluten development, kickstart the fermentation, and um, make it a lot easier to develop the gluten in the next stage, which is a good thing, right? Lower energy bills. Woohoo! So I'll just speed that up a little bit. We'll try not to cover the kitchen and the crew and myself and flour. So we'll just get things ticking along a bit here. Right, so we're mixing that in. It's starting to form a nice rough shaggy ball. And all we're looking for here is full combination of the ingredients. And um, we want to try and get rid of as much of the sort of rough, uh, rough little scraps of flour around the bottom of the bowl as possible. I feel like I should be providing some lift music at this stage or something. Or a little bit of a rolling commentary. The dough hook is going around the bowl. The ball is bouncing around the bowl. It's starting to try and escape out of the top. So we'll slow it down a little bit. And at this stage, it looks like we're almost there. Um, I'm wondering if the mixer might need a tiny bit of help to just get those last scraps. Nup, nup, it's going. It's all good. No interference required. It's got it. So if any of the viewers at home have got any questions at this point, or if they want to let us know where they're watching from, or perhaps let us know what your favourite flavour pizza is or something. But um, send us in some questions so we can ask Ange while she's here. Yeah, please do. And I will do my very best to uh, reply to everyone. So what we've got here is a nice fully combined dough ball. Uh, you can see it's not really got any structural integrity yet. We haven't developed the gluten and that's not what we were going for. We just want to get that into the bowl and get that ready to move on to the next stage where we are going to add our salt and do our gluten development and dough strengthening. So I'm just getting the bowl out, putting it back on the scales, because you'll notice I didn't add any salt in the last stage, and that was intentional. 
Now, I like to let the uh, dough rest a little bit before I add the salt. That allows the gluten to sort of start doing its thing. Most importantly, it lets the sourdough starter get a hold on the, that flour and water without any of the salt, because the salt actually slows things down a little bit, keeps the sourdough starter in check. So we're just giving it a little bit of space to do that. But I like to get that in now, before it does its auto lease, and just sprinkle it over the top. So mainly so I don't forget. Now this is one of the little um, twists that we were talking about. Now, um, Neapolitan pizza is uh, said to be the best in the world because of a number of things, but one of them is the water that you get in the town there. So the water has filtered through lots of volcanic rocks and it's picked up all of that mineralogy, all of those wonderful minerals from the rocks it's filtered through which give you a water that's, you know, not so nice for drinking, but gives you a really good pizza. Now to try and get that little uh, bit of authenticity into our pizza, we're gonna add a little twist by using volcanic salt. And now I've warned the crew, <laughs> it's not me, it honestly is the salt. It doesn't smell great, it's all that sulfur in it, but it definitely adds something to the pizza dough. So you can see, you get it in like these little crystal forms and you can bash that up and just grind it nice and fine to get some salt like that that we can use in our recipe. You can also buy it, you know, uh, fine like this as well for using straight. So we're gonna go in with just over 2% of salt on top of our dough. And did you say, where can you purchase that from? Is it just oh. a supermarket thing or? Yeah, yeah, you can get it from most supermarkets. Um, if you can't find it in your local supermarket, just have a little bit of a Google online. You'll definitely find it. Um, there's quite a lot of fancy posh salts out there that you can play around with. And um, this is one of the ones that I got in a little bit of a gift kit that have had several different kinds of salts. And it hasn't been very popular in our house for some reason. <laughs> So I'm stoked to find a use for it and get rid of the stuff. But no, really, it does add a little bit extra to our pizza and makes it that little bit special. So we'll just go in with our 10 grams of salt, just sprinkled over the top. Almost there. Okay, tiny bit more. Get our salt bay on, get that going in. There we go. Now, let's put that to one side, get the lid back on it. And we'll just set our dough to one side now, with the salt over it. It's not gonna interfere too much with things like this. And we'll just cover that loosely, put it to one side, and let it have a bit of a rest for at least half an hour, maybe an hour or so. So that, you don't need to mix the salt in at not all? Not yet, not yet. No. We're letting it have its auto lees. So we could mix it in now, we could have added the salt at the start as well. Um, you'll see in most uh, recipes where you're dealing with the yeasted uh, pizza, you'll put the salt in at the start before you add the yeast. You add that to the water, dissolve it in, and then add the yeast. Because we're dealing with a sourdough culture, which you know it's a bit gentler all round, we like to add the salt afterwards. So we'll just set that to one stage, one side now, with the salt on it, so that we don't forget to mix it in. Because you definitely do not want to forget the salt. And after about half an hour or so, we'll mix in our salt and um, start working our dough. So pretend half an hour has passed and we're going to kick on with mixing that in. So just mix in your salt, speed things up a little bit. and um, give it a good mix on a medium speed for about mm, five to six minutes or so. Keep an eye on it though, because with the stand mixer you can overdevelop your dough. And if that happens, it's really hard to recover. Things will start losing their stretch and it, it just becomes a bit of a mess to work with. So we'll mix our dough for a few minutes. And what we're looking for to tell us that um, the dough is ready, it's got enough gluten development, enough strength, is for the dough to start coming away from the sides of the bowl, from the bottom of the bowl, and basically it'll start having a bit of a walk around the bowl. At that stage, we'll know it's about ready. So, what I might do 
is cut to the chase now with one that I've prepared earlier. So we'll set that to one side and we'll now dive into our bowl full of dough that's been fully worked and has loads of lovely gluten development. So we prepared this one earlier, same as this. Basically, we would have mixed that a few more minutes to get it to this stage. And um, now we've got a lovely elastic dough in here. Just give my hands a quick rinse, be right back with you. Now I'm switched on um, my microphone. The um, jeweler was asking whether there's any cheats way to do a leaven, whether you can pre-bite or you just do the hard yards on it. Well, if you, if you ask your local sourdough bakery really, really nicely, they might be able to give you a bit of their sourdough starter. But most places make enough to, um, you know, enough to do their batch for the day. So maybe give them a bit of warning and they might be able to help you out. Uh, but yeah, it's really easy to make your own sourdough culture at home. And as I mentioned, if you already have uh, a white flour starter, you can skip the whole leaven building thing, which gives you a head start on the recipe. Just go straight in with your sourdough starter in that case. Um, you could also do it with like a whole wheat starter if you keep one of those at home. Um, that'd be fine. You'd just have a slightly more hearty pizza, which isn't a bad thing. All right. So... Our dough has um, been mixed for a good sort of five, six minutes, and it has now got enough strength to move on to the next stage. And we can tell this by doing the good old window pane test. So if you can gather up a little bit of your dough and stretch it out thin enough to create a really thin little membrane, a little window pane, if you will, that you can pretty much see through then we're good we know our dough is going to have enough strength to hold up to our long fermentation process trap all those little bits of air to give us a nice sort of bubbly gorgeous pizza crust and we can set that aside now covered for a few hours to do its bulk proof now, um, I'll mention at this stage that if you are doing this by hand in the usual uh, sourdough breadsmith beginner's method, uh, we would have mixed our sourdough uh, starter in with our flour and water and other ingredients, let it have an auto lease, then we would have started doing a series of stretch and folds. Now, stretches and folds are super easy. I'll just demonstrate quickly. So if you don't have a stand mixer at home, all you do is grab a corner of your dough, stretch it up and fold it up over the top. And that is a really good sort of low energy way of developing that gluten strength, that dough strength, without the use of a stand mixer and without having to knead the dough for like, you know, 20 minutes or so. Right. Um, now, if you're following the method by hand, you'd be doing that every 30 minutes or so for a couple of hours to build in that gluten development. And that's gonna give you about two or three sets of stretch and folds. All right, because we've mixed it in the stand mixer, we can bypass all that and just set it at one step side, somewhere nice and cozy for its bulk proof. Now, bulk proof uh, can take anywhere between two to six hours, depending on the method you're following and the temperature that you're working with. It's really cold here in Perth at the moment, so it takes a bit longer. We'll just pop that over there and we'll pull out our dough that has fully proofed. Now you see there, that has pretty much doubled in size. Got a little bit of tape there to show where we started off at. And we've got a nice increase in size there. With sourdough, if you don't see the dramatic sort of doubling in size that you do working with a, with a commercial yeast or a baker's yeast. But we do see loads of lovely bubbles. You can see them along the base, along the sides, which tell us that you know, the sourdough's done its job. There's been heaps of activity. And um, there's a good little bit of wibble. We did the wibble test. Plenty of wibble in there to show us that you know, there's enough volume and air in there for us to move on to the next stage. So once you've bulked your dough, 
then what we can do is move on to the next step, which is dividing and shaping. Now, in the nodes, I've given you the, um, the measurement to do a half batch of dough, which will give you two 10 inch pizzas and a normal batch of dough, which will give you about four pizzas, okay? So we've done the four pizzas here. Now, if you were doing half the batch, then obviously you would just would have halved the amount of leaven that you used as well, so halve those measurements and halve the ingredients that we put in. Now, we're gonna tip that out and divide that up. So onto a nice clean countertop here. We'll just clear a few things out of the way make ourselves a little bit of space to work with here. And you might find to swap out the KitchenAid now. Have you finished with this one? Thanks, Joe. That yes. would be amazing. Good one. Right. So what we'll do now is just start dividing out our dough. Now, I had a bench scraper here somewhere. Ah, there it is. I like to use a dough scraper, first of all, and just get that out onto our nice clean bench top. And you'll notice that I'm not using any flour at this stage. We don't really need it. We're just gonna ease the dough out of the bowl. And when it's properly proofed, you won't really have too many dramas with it sticking to the surface or your hands. And we wanna minimize the amount of flour that we're throwing around the kitchen anyway, otherwise we get into trouble with the other half. So, get that out, ease it out of the bowl. Admire that lovely gluten development. Look at that, very nice. And now what we're gonna do is just ease it out into a bit of a rough square, which is gonna help me with dividing it up into four. So there we go. Trying not to knock too much of the air out of it at this stage. And um, what we'll do now is just maybe sprinkle a tiny bit of flour over the top, just so that the dough knife cuts through it nicely. A little bit on our bench knife as well. And we'll just divide that up. So divide and conquer. And you can measure this out as well. Each portion is gonna be roughly 200 grams because we've done an 800 gram batch of dough here for our four pizzas. Or you can live dangerously like I do and uh, portion it out by eye and hope that there are no fights afterwards about someone's pizza being bigger than the other. Right, what we're going to do once we've divided is just give it a rough little pre-shape. So we're going to start building up that, that shape for the piece of dough to give it a bit of strength because the next step we're going to do is a long proof and we want it to have enough strength to go through that. So what we're doing is just pre-shaping into a ball or a little ball. Just, just gently, we're not gonna overdo it at this stage. All right, I'll talk you through this one. So what I'm doing here is just making myself some little corners and then tucking them in towards the middle and giving myself a rough little ball shape and then just gently forming it with, the with um, sort of cupping my hands and gently forming it into a bit of a ball. There we go, pop any big bubbles as you go along. And we'll do that with the other ones now. Fold them in, tuck them in, fold and tuck. There we go, and then flip it over and just give it a rough little rounding off. Just cupping your hands and using the tension with the bench, which is why we didn't want too much flour around as well, to just get that in to a rough pre-shape. And just pop a few of those balls, um, a few of those bubbles on there. And there we go. Nice little bit of bounce there. Good sign of a fully proofed dough. And it's just lovely to work with because we're working with the low hydration here. It's a really manageable dough. So great fun. I and mean, this is probably one that you can teach the kids to do as well. They'll have great fun with this. I mean, the whole sourdough bread baking thing is basically Play-Doh for adults. So, you know, what's not to love? Right. How many Once pizzas do you think those? you've had since you got the pizza oven? How many, how many have you cooked in there? I don't really want to say, Joe. <laughs> Quite a lot. Obviously, we've been doing the recipe development and um, taste testing, of course. It's a tough job, but someone has to do it. 
So we've done a few and we're really impressed with it so far. We've got a wood-fired oven at home as well, but on a rainy day or, you know, if you just fancy a pizza, it's awesome to just be able to plug that in, fire it up and make a really nice pizza at home. And because you get such high temperatures with this thing, um, you can achieve that sort of Neapolitan pizza, which requires really high temperatures at home, uh, which is a bit trickier to do without it, but we'll talk through that in a moment. So once we've pre-shaped and we're happy with that, we'll let the dough rest for about 10 to 20 minutes. It'll just let it relax um, and it will make it a lot easier to do the final shaping in the next stage. So just lay those to one side, let them have a little rest, cover them loosely, a little bit of flour over the top, covered loosely and left at room temperature for about 20 minutes just to relax, do their thing. So, you know, maybe we should all go grab a coffee quick, pop back in 20. It's all right, we'll just jump straight into it. I can handle it, it'll be fine. So we get our dough balls. Let's start with the one I shaped first. Get a little bit of flour down on our bench top now, because at this stage we don't want it to stick too much. And we're gonna get our dough ball skin side down. So that's the side you've built all that tension on. We wanna keep that side down on the bench top for our next shaping step, because it's just gonna help make that a little bit tighter and it's also gonna be a little less sticky than working with that side. So onto the countertop, then just gently flatten it out a little bit. So this is the, um, the actual shaping of our pizza dough balls. And there's a few methods, you can have quite a lot of fun with this. I tend to just go with the standard sort of flatten out, stretch and fold it back over. That works really well, really easy. Keep going round moving it in towards the middle. You don't want to squash it down too much in the middle though. We don't want to make our ball too flat. We want a nice sort of proud little dough ball there. And then just pinch the ends together and flip them over. Then take some of the flour off your bench and you can rotate it round in your hands like this, just cupping your hands gently using your pinkies to sort of pinch underneath and close that seam up. And you can see how nicely that's sort of ballooning up between my hands. We're building a really nice bit of tension, a skin onto the surface of the dough there, which is gonna help it hold its shape when we give it its nice long cold proof in the fridge. So there we go. That one I would say is done. Pop that to one side and we'll move on to the next one. So the good thing about uh, making pizza at home like this is you've got to get quite a lot of practice with, um, with uh, shaping the dough as well. And honestly, when you start making sourdough, you become a bit of a snob in terms of all baked goods. So normal pizza just will not suffice anymore. We have to have homemade sourdough pizza. So for this one, well, we can either do the same thing with just folding those edges in, or you can just loosely fold in the top fold in the sides and then flip it over. So that's another way. And then you just sort of cup it, squeeze it using the tension that you're building up between your hands and the board to really get that shape nice. Then you can put it out there and sort of drag it towards yourself, rotate, do the same thing, which are also good ways of building up the tension on the dough. And the other method is to just get that whole dough ball flour it a little, get in your hand, and just do it like that. Easy. So just see, see what works for you. Then I just give it a little twist at the bottom. And there we have our dough ball formed. So a few little techniques to play with there. Put that to one side. And the last one, we'll do this one the traditional way. And you can see even though it hasn't rested that long, just that little bit of extra time it's had to rest on the bench and relax, it's softer and easier to shape. So definitely worth letting it have that rest if you can. Okay, tuck that in nicely, flip it over, give it a little spin. Right, so now we've got our dough balls. There we go. We've got a couple of options now as well. 
I've done the, a full batch of pizza dough here because what you can do is if you just want a couple of pizzas, you can actually take two of those, pop them in the fridge, uh, in the freezer, sorry, and you can leave them there for like, you know, a couple of weeks, a month or two, and have ready-made pizza dough on standby. Basically, you'd get, those, get that out of the freezer the night before you wanted to use it, pop it in the fridge overnight to defrost, and there you go. Shortcut to sourdough pizza. <laughs> but what we're gonna do is uh, just get that onto a tray. We'll use this one over here. Get a little bit of oil on that. And we're gonna get those onto the tray, ready to go into the fridge and do a nice little proof in there. So I like to just put it top down initially, just to get a little bit of oil over the top, which helps prevent a skin forming on top because uh, we want to avoid that. That's one of the, the sort of fails that you can get with a pizza at home, is it forming a skin on top that's not nice to work with and doesn't give you a great pizza. So just roll it around in the oil a little bit and put it on the, on the tray. You want a nice big flat tray here with loads of space for it to expand because they're going to rise a little bit here. Give it a nice little coating. A little slick of olive oil. This stuff smells amazing. Okay, last one. There we go. Now they're all on the board. What we'll do is cover them over with a bit of, bit of well, another tray would be ideal. Otherwise, a little bit of cling over the top, a um, bit of baking paper, a bowl, whatever you've got at hand, really. And just cover them over, pop them in the fridge for a nice long cold proof. Now ideally you're going to leave it on the countertop for about half an hour or so just to relax before it goes into the fridge and then you can put it in the fridge from anywhere anywhere between 12 and sort of 48 hours. The longer you leave it the better really I've found it just allows the flavour to really develop with the dough and you get a really nice result out of it. Um, if you wanted to sort of shortcut that and didn't want to let it have the cold proof in the fridge you could just leave these out at this stage um, once they're just about doubled you'd be ready to go so depending on your room temperature at home that could take you know a couple of hours or so so we could potentially have these for dinner tonight no dramas but what we'll do now is just set these to one side cover them over pop them in the fridge and then after sort of 12 hours or so, what you'll have is some lovely relaxed dough like this. So made these ones yesterday and they've been proofing in the fridge overnight. They've shifted a little bit in the journey over here, no matter. Uh, you can see those are really relaxed, really increased in size and those are good to go. So that's sort of what we're looking for. We want our dough to be nice and sort of billowy, quite soft, loads of air bubbles in there. We'll risk a little peek there. You can just see how the dough's developed. That's looking really good. Now, once you've got those out of the fridge, you're gonna to wanna to leave them on your bench top for a few hours, a couple of hours or so, uh, just to come to room temperature. It's gonna be a lot easier to deal with once it's at room temperature. So, we are now ready to do our shaping of our actual pizza bases. Very exciting. So what I do for this is I just get a good little handful of semolina. And at this stage, it's not really possible to use too much semolina. It gives it a really nice crust as well as acting as like little ball bearings to help the dough slide around and not stick. Then what we're gonna do is get our pizza ball out of the container and put it face side down on the bench top. Everyone right. at home is very quiet today. We haven't got many questions coming through. Don't forget to ask some questions um, at home. Okay. So we've got our pizza ball out now and we're just letting it relax on the pizza on the, the countertop here and we're going to begin to shape it. Now for 
a proper Neapolitan pizza, what we're going to want is a really thin, crispy base, but we also want that lovely outer crust, so that really puffed up crust around the edge, which is, uh, forgive how I'm mispronouncing this now, but the cornichet around the edge. So to do that, we're just going to flour our hands and we're going to gently press down in the middle of our dough ball, out towards the edges. And at this stage, you can pretty much decide how thick you want that outer crust to be. So I like mine about a couple of centimeters thick. So just take it out to that far, rotate your dough, and then go in there and do the same thing around the other side. And then you can just get your fist and gently flatten out that sort of little hump in the middle and gently work it out into your pizza base shape. Don't be too rough with it at this stage. You don't want to knock all that air out of the crust or you're not going to get all those lovely little air pockets. So be really gentle. Just go in there and uh, give it a nice little shaping. Now this is just the start of it. Um, I find that it's easier to do this in two stages. So once you've got a rough shape there and it's about half its final size, move that over to the side and just let that rest for a minute or two while we get the next one done. More semolina out. And then we'll grab our next dough ball. Right, just get in there with a little bit of semolina over the top and start flattening that out. Go nice and gentle, gently, gently pushing it out to form the shape that you want with that nice thick crust around the edge. Rotate that round and repeat it all the way around our little bit of pizza dough here. Then you can also flip it over if you like, do the same from the other side. Just remember to flip it back over again because that's the side that's going to be naturally kind of non-stick. So it's going to be a lot easier to get this off our pizza peel if it's that side down, right? Get your fist in there, just gently flatten it out. And you can see we formed a lovely little outer perimeter on our pizza base here which is going to give us a nice little crust. It's also going to serve to hold in our pizza toppings, which will be good. So once you've done that, lay that to one side, let it have a little bit of a rest. Now, at that point, while it's resting, it's a good opportunity to make our pizza topping. So get your sauce together, get all your toppings of choice together. And also, of course, preheat your pizza oven. So um, I find with this thing you want to get it nice and hot. So just switch that on and give it a good preheat at sort of medium high temperature. Because it's got a pizza stone in there you're going to want to heat your pizza stone really well to make sure you get that initial burst of heat and that oven spring which is going to give us a lovely crust. So well worth preheating it um, as long as possible. If you're working with pizza oven, um, if you're working with a pizza stone at home, get that in the oven a good half hour or so before you want to bake your pizza and that's going to get it nice and super hot. Um, if you don't have a pizza stone, you can also have a go at uh, doing a combination of using your stove top and a nice heavy based sort of cast iron pan, like, um, oh, this little Crusoe here is a really good option. So just a nice shallow pan like that We'll uh, do the job, get your pizza in there, get it super hot on the stove top first, then you put your base in, um, start the cooking process, top it, and then pop it under the grill. So it's a bit more of a rigmarole, just get one of those, easy. All right, 
so we're going to go on with making our sauce while our little pizza doughs just sort of chill out on the side there and relax. So into a nice bowl, we're going to make the classic red sauce, the tomato sauce that forms the base of our pizza. Um, we've just got a tin of plum tomatoes here and I just like to take the tomatoes themselves out of the, the liquid in there, trying not to get too much of the liquid because we don't want our sauce to be too wet. Otherwise, you're gonna sit down to your pizza and you're gonna have a soggy bottom and no one wants that. So we'll just drain our plum tomatoes into the bowl here. And I find you need sort of two plum tomatoes per 10 inch pizza base. So we're gonna want about four in here. Let's get those out into the bowl. Set that to one side. Then we can go in and season. Just got a little bit of flaky sea salt here. Good little pinch of that. Maybe a little bit of olive oil. And then we can go in with our other seasonings. I like to use a little bit of dried oregano in our pizza sauce. Uh, bonus points if it's homegrown. Get those in there. And you know how it is, only the best for our sourdough pizza. It's got to be homegrown. If not, just get some nice, nice dried or even fresh oregano. Works really well in this sauce. Just crunch that up into there. Take out all the little sticky bits. Right. And then we're going to... Actually, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to crushing the tomatoes before I add the chilli and garlic just so I don't get it too much all over my hands. So what I like to do now is just go in there, clean hands, and crush my tomatoes. Just kind of coarsely, I don't like, you know, don't like it too thin. It's nice to have a few chunks of tomatoes, gives it a little bit of texture, looks better on the pizza. And these just smell amazing, like really nice and fresh. And allowing, to ha allowing the sauce to have some chunks like that also preserves some of that lovely fresh tomato sort of character which is awesome on a Neapolitan pizza. So just break it up loosely in your hands. And then we'll go on with our other flavorings. That's looking pretty good. If you did want to, you could uh, you know, keep your hands clean and use like a fork or potato masher to do that. It's a Neapolitan pizza, we can be rustic about it. Just get that in there. All right, I'll just give my hands a quick rinse. Ange, um, Sally on Facebook is asking if you were to use a higher hydration recipe, can you cook it straight from the fridge to make it more manageable? Uh, you potentially could. You would then need to proof your dough a little bit more before it went into the fridge though, because it kind of has its final proof at room temperature while it's coming to room temperature. But yeah, that's totally doable. And if you're more experienced with dealing with a hydrated dough, then by all means, up the hydration. What we're trying to achieve with this recipe is a really kind of approachable, accessible way for everyone to make a really nice Neapolitan style pizza at home, which is why we're using a low hydration dough. But yeah, if, if you fancy it and um, done it before, go nuts, add a bit more water. No dramas. All right, so we've got most of our sauce together here. I'm just gonna add a few more seasonings in now. So I like to add a little bit of chili. Again, bonus points if it's homegrown. And just get those flakes in there. And you can decide how hot you like it here. Um, Cause I'm not sure how much chili the uh, crew like and they are definitely going to be helping me eat these pizzas knock, afterwards. Knock yourself out, I'm definitely helping. All right, chili we're going for a whole chili now, whole chili. All right, let's do this. Okay, so just chop up your chili, get that into your sauce, and we're going to go in with a little bit of garlic as well. How garlicky do we want it? Again, you can decide how garlicky you want it. I generally go in with about half a clove. What's the consensus, guys? Yeah? 
The boys are giving a nod. Everyone's good with garlic. Everyone's good with chilli. I was kind of hoping that they wouldn't like chilli, so I would get more. But <laughs> I think all of us are very hungry watching you do this. It looks amazing. <laughs> All right, well, we'll be kind just in case anyone's got some dates afterwards and go in with half a chili, half a clove of garlic. Now, my mum's actually got a really nice little hack for this. And if you don't want your garlic to be too punchy, you know, sort, sort of too pungent and it's got that little burn to it, then um, rather than chopping it up like I do, you can crush it with a bit of salt and the back of a wooden spoon. And that just mellows it out somehow. I'm not sure what actually goes on there that makes it a little bit more mellow, but something happens, a little bit of mom magic, and you end up with a much mellower garlic. But yeah, we like, we like our garlic punchy and really in your face. So nice little chopped garlic going into the mix there. Okay, put that out the way. And now what we're going to need, Joe, is just a little spoon, a um, tablespoon or something, just to combine that. Thank you. Can I have a spoon to spread on the sauce after as well? Thank you. Right, so we're just combining all our other lovely flavorings into our tomato sauce here. Uh, and, you know, doing that with a spoon rather than by hand, because, you know, chilies eyes ouch right that's done ah oh, magic thank you joe and we've got a little spoon for getting that onto our pizzas shortly so we'll just set that to one side for the moment well we come back to our pizza dough and just spread out a little bit more semolina again and we're going to finalize the shaping on this so you can see how much softer that dough is now that it's had that little little chance to relax. So a bit more flour uh, semolina over it, flip it over. And we're just gonna shape that a little bit more, stretch it out a little bit. We're aiming for like a 10 inch pizza base here. So there's a few techniques to this. Um, I find just sort of flattening it out with your hand, using sort of the palm of your hand to get into where you want that crust to be, or the side of your hand like that and just moving around the dough, turning it around, gets you there. Flattening out that middle every now and then, giving it a flip, turning it back over, and slowly just stretching out that base. Now you can also use gravity to help you here. So hold it sort of towards the middle and kind of like, like steering wheel styly, rotate the dough letting gravity help you stretch out that crust. Because we want to end up with an even thickness all the way through, really nice thin pizza dough with a thick outer edge to give us a nice crust. Right, so we can keep going round and round. Would you ever use a rolling pin or not with sourdough? Or, I know this is traditional. You, but... Yep, traditional, you're gonna do a hand stretch pizza. Uh, the reasons you want to do that is to get those little air bubbles throughout the base, but also to get that lovely crust around the edge. If you use a rolling pin with that, it's gonna be very hard to get that lovely little outer edge, which is gonna hold in our fillings and you know, give us some lovely tasty pizza crust afterwards. But if you wanted to, you could go in with a rolling pin, no judgment. Just don't do it in front of me. <laughs> okay, and we can be, you know, a little bit fancier with it as well. So we can get our fists like that and just start turning it gently on our knuckles, right? Which will also help stretch out that dough nicely. Right, see how nice of that stretching now? And if you wanna be really fancy, you can go in with a fist and give it a little flip with the other hand. You make that look so easy. <laughs> it's, it's practice. <laughs> And I'm, I'm being very careful so I don't end up with it, end up having it on my face. <laughs> All right, so once you've got that to sort of the size that you want, that's looking about right to me, we can get it onto our pizza peel, start topping it and get it ready to go into the oven. Um, we'll just set that one to one set aside and we'll do that one in a little while. Let me grab my pizza peel. Again, you want to make sure that you've got heaps of semolina on this. 
you don't want it to stick. And then just get your pizza dough onto the peel to do the topping. That's looking pretty good. Perfect. All right, so now we're gonna go in with our tomato sauce for our classic sort of margarita styly Neapolitan-ish pizza. So, whoop, turn that on again. A couple of tablespoons is about all you need on your pizza dough. Start out in the middle. And really, when you're doing a pizza topping, less is more, seriously. Uh, you're gonna struggle a little bit and end up with a pool of water on your pizza if you go overboard with the topping. So just gently sort of spiral the spoon out across your dough, getting a nice even layer of tomato sauce. Try and keep it tidy, keep it inside that rim so that uh, you don't end up with sauce on your peel, which is then gonna stick and cause you all kinds of headaches. We don't want that. So, once our tomato sauce is on, we're gonna go in with some classic toppings. So over here, we have got some lovely mozzarella. And we're using a sort of it's kind of a fresh, semi-dry mozzarella here, not the fresh stuff you get in water, because I find with that, it's just got a little bit too much moisture in it, and then you might find your toppings kind of swimming a little bit. So just dot a, dot a little bit of mozzarella on top of your pizza, nice and even. And um, one of the comments on uh, questions on there was, if you mm -hmm. happen to get a hole in it, would you just push it back together? What would your solution be to that? Oh, I'd probably, you know, go sit in the corner, assume the fetal position, and cry for a little bit. <laughs> but after that, I'd just pinch a little bit of dough off the side and use that to patch up that hole, and you'll be absolutely fine. It'll be a nice rustic-looking pizza, and no one will know except for you. It'll be fine. <laughs> All right, so. Less is more, little bit of cheese on it, not too much, don't go too nuts. And what we're gonna do now is um, go in with any other toppings that you would like. We're gonna keep this one really nice and classic. Right, what we can do is maybe just go in with a touch more olive oil. So, gotta do the classic six if you're doing it really Italian styly and just drizzle that on. And then, no mucking about, get it straight into your pizza oven which is gonna be interesting from this angle. So bear with me, I might just rotate this slightly. There we go. Then into our nice preheated pizza oven, shake off a little bit of the excess semolina first. Make sure your pizza base moves and get it into your pizza oven onto that preheated stone. Okay, and you can sort of just jiggle it around on there to get it nice and even. Then, get that lid down, and that's gonna put some heat over the top, really sort of sizzle those toppings while giving it that nice burst of heat from the base to get the crust to puff up really nicely. So with this thing, we'll crank it up a little. It only takes a few minutes to make your pizza. It's really, really pretty quick. Um, How, if you were doing this at home... What, what temperature do you have it on? Then? I've got this all the way up on five. So five. I was preheating on four just to get the stone nice and hot. And now it's on five while well, I just sort of give it a really good quick sizzle. Um, now, that will do the job in a few minutes. Uh, if you don't have one of these pizza ovens at home and you're having a crack, then as I said, get your heavy base saucepan, frying pan, on your, on your stove top, on your hob. Get that super hot pizza base in. Top it in the pan and then stick it under a hot grill and you'll get, you'll get a similar effect. So while that's cooking, we might just shape our next one up and um, have a think about some of the other lovely toppings that you can do. Classic Neapolitan one, you've just got those sort of three components. You've got the tomato base, the mozzarella cheese, and then we'll finish it off with a little bit of lovely fresh basil at the end but you can play around with some lovely cured meats, um, some artichokes, some olives, anchovies, um, as some of my you know, more Italian friends appreciate. 
afraid it's not quite something I've ever got used to. My favourite's um, fresh rosemary with olive oil and rock salt. Oh, in that oven, it's delicious. Oh, amazing. And that's the other option. I mean, instead of doing a red sauce base like we have, you can use cream cheese or ricotta or something and do a white base and then layer on some slices of potato with some rosemary and a little bit of extra garlic. It'd be amazing. Um, yeah, just have a play. Have a play around. It's the great thing about making your pizza at home. You can do it, put whatever you like on it without judgment, even pineapple. No one there to shout at you. Although, don't tell me. <laughs> All right, so we've stretched that one out nicely. And we're just about ready to get that one out, I think. We're going to go for another little spin. We'll try this. Hey. <laughs> All right, and there is our second pizza dough ready to be topped. We'll get that one onto our peel. A little bit of semolina on that. And one thing to do is just make sure that it actually moves around when it's on your peel, because then you know it's not gonna stick. And then top that up as you wish. Now that is looking pretty damn good to me, so we might move along and get our pizza out. So we'll get our board ready. And we'll get the little pizza peels that came with the machine. Turn that off for safety's sake, just so I don't scorch my knuckles as we go in to grab our pizza. And have a look at that. That is looking beautiful. We've got that lovely sort of scorching around the edges of the crust. It's puffed up beautifully because of that lovely contact heat that it got from the pizza stone. And the cheese is melted and blistered and golden and brown. It, it's good. It looks amazing, I have to say. All right, so while that's still nice and hot, we're gonna go in with our basil. Get that on. Some lovely little bits of fresh basil here, keeping it really classic. And while it's still hot, it'll sort of wilt that basil down beautifully and help release all of that flavor. Go in with a tiny little bit of extra, extra virgin olive oil. And just, you know, because in Italy, Parmesan cheese is basically just a seasoning. We'll go in with a little bit of extra parmesan. Get that over the crust so you've got a lovely cheesy crust there. Just a tiny bit. And a tiny bit more. And there we go. That is our sourdough pizza. Done. Fantastic. How amazing is that? It smells incredible in here. You are so clever, you make it look so easy as well. Oh, thanks Jo. Um, it is, it's a really, really easy recipe to do at so home. Good. Um, really nice dough to work with. Now I'm just going to get some Beautiful. of the semolina off. So yeah. thank you everyone for joining us today and I hope you guys learned something. If you missed anything, please um, have a look on YouTube and as Ange mentioned, it's also on her website, Sourdough Breadsmith. Uh, and Join us again. If you also, if you wanted to check online on the YouTube channel, we also have Ange doing basic sourdough and an intermediate as well. And what was something we said we were going to do next? Well, we're thinking of doing a couple more workshops, maybe looking at how to use sourdough discard. Yes, um, and also the and sweet ones. Working with the sweet dough, so sweet and rich doughs. Um, that's heaps of fun as well. There's lots that you can do. So with let that. us know what you guys would like to see as well, and we'll catch you again soon. Uh, thanks, Ange, and see you later. Thanks, guys. We're going to tuck into this. Um, don't forget to check us out online. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram, and uh, on the website as well. Thanks for tuning in. See you later.